I certainly want to thank you if you prayed for Kathy and me as we were in uh, the northern parts these last nine days or so. We arrived back uh, early last evening, and uh, it was an intensive week. We had 18-hour 18 18 hour days just about every day, I would say, getting up very early, driving into France for um, morning classes at the Bible Institute in Algrange. And then in the afternoon, various activities. Kathy, when I was teaching, was following up on various relationships that we had had with uh, lost people. And uh, as together, we did some of those, <coughs> those contacts as well. And then also time with various people in the church in Luxembourg, both in the afternoons and the evenings. And uh, there were good opportunities there to report on uh, the work here and people are very interested and they certainly pray for the uh, work going forward here in Bella Madina and in the Malaga region. So thank you for praying for us, those of you who remembered us while we were gone. And uh, we were not sick, we were not overly tired, but it's sure good to be back home, sleeping in our own bed and uh, having a little time to go uh, piano piano. In Semana Santa, of course, people in this part of Europe think about the Passover, which is approaching at the end of this week and of Resurrection Sunday. And it is tradition here in Benalmadena and Malaga and across Spain and much of Northern Europe as well to celebrate Palm Sunday. And I would like us to look at a passage of scripture that situates itself at around this same time, it's found in John's Gospel in chapter 10, uh, 12. John chapter 12, and I would like to read, beginning in verse 1 and going through verse 36. John chapter 12, verses 1 to 36 included. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus which had been dead, was, whom he had raised from the dead. And there they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of his ointment, of, of the ointment. And then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. And then said Jesus, let her alone against the day of my burying, hath she kept this. For the poor always have you with you, but me... Ye have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna! Blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for that they had heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, Perceive ye not how, how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world has gone after him. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. 
The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. And Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said, an angel spake unto him. Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou, The Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? And Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. Father, help us in these moments that we're together as we get ready to begin this week to receive the message from your word that you have in mind for each one of us. We know that your spirit can take anything from the written scriptures and apply anything he wishes to our own hearts and our own experience. And we pray that his ministry might be very individually crafted to each one of us who knows the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. Thank you for guiding me as I preach. And we pray that what is said here will be honoring to you and will be correct according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Back in the 1970s, when Kathy and I were ministering among French-speaking people, there was a lady who lived just about a block away from the meeting room on the Boulevard Pierre Dupont in the middle of Luxembourg City. She came regularly to services. She was very committed to the work. She had a relative who was a well-known author in France, and she was a committed believer who really tried to do her very best to be of service to others. She knew another lady in the city, let's call her uh, Madame G. Uh, she showed some interest also in spiritual things, and our friend uh, invited her to have a personal Bible study uh, with us, and I proposed that we would start with the Gospel of John and move through this Bible book to find out who Jesus really was and is. And so Madame G uh, agreed, and we began to come along with this church member, who was very enthusiastic about the possibility that um, her friend might become a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ as well. And we sailed along during some months through one chapter at a time in John's Gospel. And Madame G seemed to be genuinely interested in uh, the person of Jesus, whom John portrays so vividly in this book. The one who would give the Spirit, John chapter 1. The one who changed water 
into wine and cast out the money changers from the temple, John chapter 2. The uneducated rabbi who had a nighttime interaction with Nicodemus, the very learned Jewish man who needed to see his need for the new birth, according to the prophet Ezekiel, chapters 36 and 37, John chapter 3. The unassuming um, Samaritan lady, this immoral woman who was devastated by one bad experience in a marriage after the other and whom Jesus asked for a drink of water to introduce her to himself, John chapter 4. Jesus, the one who healed the paralytic at the pool of Bethsaida, John chapter 5, on a Sabbath day and made himself into a scandal with the Jewish leaders. And past chapter 5, in chapter 6, the one who multiplied loaves and fishes to feed thousands and declared himself to be the bread of life. We went through chapter 7. Jesus, the one who introduced himself at the Feast of Tabernacles as the one who would make his followers a source of living water. And then, of course, chapter 8, the chapter that talks about the Lord Jesus is dealing with a woman caught in the act of adultery and declaring himself to be the light of the world. And John 9, uh, the Jesus who healed the blind man on the Sabbath day, you never are supposed to do miracles on the Sabbath, and declared himself to be the door to the sheepfold and the shepherd of the sheep and the one who holds his people in his hand so that no one can be uh, pulled away from him. And she was astounded, Madame G, to read that Jesus actually raised a man from the dead in chapter 11. But then we pull into John 12, and everything changed. When she read and discussed with us the verses that we're going to look at this afternoon, she sat bolt upright in her chair, and she said, vrai, ça? That's true. C'est vraiment vrai, ça? Es verdad? Oh, then, if that's the case, I don't want to have anything to do with Jesus. So what was it that so offended Madame G? Let's look back at this passage. I want you to grasp what this text is about so that we can find out what it takes to serve and love the one who has made provision for the rescue of the world of sinners. What does it take to serve the Savior of the world? That's the question we'd like to address. Now, to be able to answer that question, we need just to remind ourselves how frequently John the Apostle emphasizes the theme of the world. If we're going to understand what it takes to serve the Savior of the world, we need to know what John says about the world. If you're familiar with Matthew's Gospel, you remember in chapter 10, where Jesus sends out the apostles to their mission, they were directed to go to the lost sheep of Israel and not to go to the Gentiles or to the Samaritans a commission that is surprising for many people who are unfamiliar with uh, the particular phases in the ministry of Christ. And he repeats this notion in Matthew chapter 15, verse 34, where when he interacts with the Syrophoenician woman a little bit later in his ministry, and she asks him to intervene for her daughter, please heal my daughter. He says, I was sent to the lost tribes of Israel. Now, Jesus clearly knew his mission in light of the instruction, instructions of the Old Testament. The Messiah is sent to the people of Israel, first of all, not to the Gentiles. And yet, if we go back to John chapter 1 
and kind of hop our way again through some of these chapters in John's Gospel, we find out that in the will of the Father, the Lord Jesus has an interest in the whole world, not just in Jewish people. And that matches, doesn't it, what God had revealed to Abraham back in Genesis 12, 15, and 17, and all of the repetition of the Abrahamic covenant to the descendants of the patriarchs, that the mission of Abraham and his descendants was to be a global mission. Abraham was to be a blessing to all the nations. And John intimates this through his gospel by frequently mentioning the world of both Jew and Gentile in John's gospel. Look at John chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Speaking of the word who was um, the light, as opposed to John the baptizer, who was not that true light. The word was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world <coughs> knew him not. Strange that the creator of the world is not recognized by the people whom he created. Nonetheless, to as many as did later welcome him, that is, Jew or Gentile, he gave the right to become the children of God. Verses 11 and 12. He came unto his own, and his own received him not, but as many as received him, as welcomed him, to them gave he a power or authority to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but God. Verse 29, same chapter. John, the baptizer, seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Not just of the people of Israel, but of the world. And chapter 3, verses 16 to 19, well-known verses. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. This is the message that Jesus explained to Nicodemus, who should have understood these things, and who seems, in light of Jesus' commentary, to have had most of them going right over the top of his head. Jesus has come into the world. The Father through him has loved the world. Jesus died for the world, and now he invites all in the world to come to him and put their trust in him. And those who do will be rescued from eternal death. They will not perish. They will have everlasting life. Chapter 4. Verse 42 also speaks about the world. Jesus is speaking uh, to the Samaritan woman in this chapter, as we mentioned a moment ago. And um, we see in verse 40 that when the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. And he abode there two days, and many more believed because of his word. And he said unto the woman, Now we believe, that, that is the, the Samaritan who believed, said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, that is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Chapter 6, verse 33. Going back to verse 32. Jesus said unto them, speaking of the Jews who are listening to his preaching, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. 
For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Multiplying the loaves and fishes brings Jesus to mention his worldwide mission. And he picks up on this further in chapter 7, verse 35. The Jews said among themselves, Whither will he go that we shall not find him? Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? Jesus had said he was going to go away. And the Jews who listen to him think, uh, well, certainly he's not going to leave us. I mean, we are, after all, the chosen people. He's not going to go to the Gentiles. I, I mean, impossible. He's not going to go teach pagans and sully his, apparently, sterling character. Look at chapter 9, verse 3. Jesus speaking about the man whom he has healed on the Sabbath day and who is questioned by his disciples, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus' answer in verse 3 is, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Chapter 10, verse 16. Verses, uh, chapters 9 and 10 are a unit that deal with this man born blind. The chapter division is uh, not really necessary and can cause us to think that we're dealing with two themes. Actually, chapters 9 and 10 should be viewed as one unit. Look at what Jesus says about the sheep, uh, some of whom are in Israel and some who are out of Israel. Other sheep I have, Jesus says, which are not of this fold. That is, they are people who know me and have a relationship with the shepherd, but they're not of this sheep fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. So there are people outside of Israel who are also sheep, who will respond to the voice of the shepherd. Chapter 11, verse 52, verse 51, this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. Speaking, of course, of Caiaphas, the high priest, who said, it, maybe it's just kind of pragmatic and useful that one person should uh, die for the whole nation. And as the high priest, Caiaphas prophesies that Jesus should die for that nation, verse 52, not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. And finally, chapter 16, verse 8, Jesus in his uh, high priestly prayer and teaching ministry makes this comment about the coming of the Holy Spirit. When he is come, he will reprove, <clears throat> that is, he will rebuke and convince and convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. This ministry of the Spirit is going to be exercised among members of the whole world, not just among Jewish people. Quite astounding. Now this is background for understanding what is going on in John chapter 12. And I want you to go back there and look at verse 20, at this little section that we would like to focus in on. John chapter 12, verse 20. If Jesus is concerned about the whole world, not just Jews, but Gentiles, all lost people, without exception, we are struck by the fact that there are particular times in Jesus' ministry 
when non-Jews will come to him and request an audience and personal ministry. And Jesus does not rebuff them, but accepts them. Chapter 12, verse 20. There were certain Greeks. Now, these are not people from Athens, necessarily. The word here that's used refers to Gentile people. They were non-Jews. And these were quite, quite probably proselytes. That is, that they were non-Jewish converts to the worship of the God of Israel. You didn't have to be born a Jew in order to be able to go to Jerusalem and worship with Jewish people. You could be a convert to Judaism as a non-Jew. Keep in mind that to be a Jew was to be part of an ethnic group. But you could be outside the ethnic group and love the God that was worshipped by the Jewish ethnic group if you were to follow certain requirements of the Mosaic law. They could be accepted. And there was much that a proselyte, a, a, a convert to Judaism, <coughs> was able to do. So these God-fearers, worshiping with the Jews, getting ready for the Passover, were going up to the Temple Mount to participate in the Passover rituals because they were certainly attracted to the higher moral sentiments and convictions of the Jewish people. Uh, there were many Gentile people in the days of the Roman Empire who were fed up to their noses with the immorality going on all around them. Maybe it sounds familiar in the 21st century in modern Europe. And so they were looking for the God of Israel and wanted to know more about him. And they worshiped there on the Temple Mount in those high holy days, those important feast days. And the text tells us in verse 21 that these people came to Philip, who was from Galilee, likely um, the only apostle who came from a Galilean town close to the Decapolis. Philip is the only one of the apostles who has a Gentile name, which suggests that he himself may have been a proselyte or part of a family that had some kind of Gentile connections. And maybe that is why they went to him, because they figured that he would understand them and gain them a hearing with the Messiah of Israel. And Philip doesn't seem to be quite comfortable. He doesn't know what to do. And uh, verse 22 says that he came and told Andrew. And Andrew and Philip come together to tell Jesus, we need two people here to broach the topic. And uh, all they want to do is to meet with Jesus and to see him. Of course, we can easily forget how difficult it may have been for people to make personal contact with Jesus. Imagine the difficulty of saying, I would like to meet Pedro Sanchez or I would like to meet um, Donald Trump, or Emmanuel Macron, or maybe someone less important, uh, Luc Frieden, the new prime minister of Luxembourg. You can't get close to these people. You need an introduction. So would you please kind of squeeze us in to the schedule? But it's not a complicated request, is it? We just like to see him and speak to him. They had heard of him. They wanted to meet with him personally. And the record of John's gospel does not tell us if Jesus actually allowed them to speak to him in a personal encounter. The grammar in verse 23 seems to mean that Jesus spoke to Philip and Andrew. That is the closest antecedent in the paragraph. Jesus answered to them, that is to Andrew and Philip, the hour is coming that the Son of Man should be glorified. What does Jesus talk about in this context? I want you to see a couple of things. Number one, in verses 23b to verse 28, Jesus announces that the glory of his coming death is going to be stupendous. Jesus announces the glory of his coming death in the end of verse 23 through verse 28. 
Look at the announcement in verse 23b. The hour is come that the Son of Man shall be glorified. Until now, Jesus has said that his hour has not come. Remember back in John chapter 2 in the marriage of the, uh, the couple in Cana who remain anonymous. Maybe they became believers and we will be able to interview them one day um, in the future to get a few more interesting details on the wedding at Cana. And Jesus' mother comes up to him and says, uh, uh, they have no more wine. Probably a heavy pause to indicate maybe you can show your power here. And Jesus responds to his mother, uh, woman, what to me and what to you, literally. In other words, uh, you need to mind your own business. My hour is not yet come. You can see this in chapter 7 and also in chapter 8. There are several attempts to snatch Jesus, to kill him. But his hour had not yet come, the text tells us. This expression, his hour, is the timing of his passion, his suffering at the cross. And in God's sovereign plan, this would happen at Passover and not before. But now Jesus says, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And the following verses are going to show us that this glory would be the glory of the ignominious cross, not the glory of the crown and the scepter. It is going to be the glory of unjust suffering. In verse 24, we see a metaphor that Jesus use, uses, which caused our acquaintance, Madame G, to be deeply offended and put off. Why would the death of Jesus be a moment of glory? He will explain it, as he often does, by a figure of speech. And he says, consider a grain of wheat. Verse 24, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn, that is a seed, a kernel of wheat, fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Why would the death of Christ be a moment of glory? Because Jesus is like a seed that is going to die. I don't know if you are a farmer by background or vocation or calling. Any uh, agricultural people here? No. So you, you've heard of seeds, right? You know, you put them in the ground and plants, you, you know that much. And these people, of course, were very familiar with the ins and outs of agriculture. We were speaking the other day when we were in, in France visiting my uh, brother, my sister-in-law, my brother's uh, wife, Madeleine. We try to keep in contact with her parents who are still lost people and are slowly beginning to weigh up the claims of Scripture. And uh, one of their sons has a farm right there. And he came in and spoke to us at great length about the problems of French farmers. And he, he knew all about this and could speak from the business perspective and the scientific perspective. He would have understood this text very well. Take a seed, put it into the ground that is extremely risky business. Because after all, what if it's swept away by a flood of rain? You know, in, in the north these days, there's far too much rain. The ground is soggy. And then if the sun comes out too early and it warms up the sun for a couple of weeks and dries it out and it's cracked, you're going to lose much of that seed. It's going to be good for nothing, especially if there's a big rainstorm that comes after a dry spell and just washes it all away. Why would you want to put your expensive seed into the ground and risk it? Or in those days, what would happen if the seed were trodden down by an ox? Or what if a drought strikes 
and all the planting comes to naught. This is the way it is. You take your seed from last year, and the seed goes into the dirt, and there it dies, and it rots in the damp. There's only one alternative, and that is you hold on to the seed, and the seed remains alone. Verse 24, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. You can't have more than one seed unless you take the risk of putting it into the ground and letting it rot. No death, no new life, no dirt, no descendant. That's the way the creation order works. On the other hand, if the grain of wheat falls into the, the bosom of the waiting ground and is covered over by the farmer, it bears much fruit. Jesus' listeners would perfectly understand how this works. They were not techies. They were people who worked with agricultural realities. No iPhones, no interruptions from email, just the dirty fingernails kind of life with the sod and with sheep. And you know, this, this is a still interesting business. I remember some years ago listening to the presentation by André Egen, who was a believing microbiologist who worked for uh, one of France's highest level uh, tech groups. And he and a colleague were working on uh, creating genetic modification for rice. Uh, most of you know that rice tends to be on the white side. You can get natural grain rice, which has a few more nutrients, but in general, rice is pure carbohydrate. And many of the people who eat rice have high incidences of blindness and infant mortality because they lack vitamin A. And so André Egan, through some very uh, highly sophisticated technology, worked with a number of other professors, Potricus, who used to work in Zurich, and Peter Beyer from the University of Freiburg, who developed together some strains of what has been called golden rice. This technology was developed back in the 1990s, and as far as I can see, it has been slowed down for various reasons. Uh, but um, just take a grain of rice that has been genetically modified, whatever you think about genetic modification of things that God has created. Fact is that this exists. You can have all of the genetic modified grains of rice that you wish in a bag, and if you don't take that grain and put it into the ground, into a field, uh, into a rice paddy, you're never going to get golden grained rice to be able to give rice speaking, uh, rice consuming people vitamin A to avoid some of these other diseases. One grain of that rice could multiply in two years into enough of a harvest to feed 100,000 children. One grain. The point I'm trying to make is, think about the potential of one kernel of corn, of wheat, one kernel of rice. But unless you throw it away in the field of dirt or the rice paddy, it just sits there, bursting with possibilities, but achieving absolutely nothing. And so there's a principle in verse 25. Let's think about how the metaphor is applied in life. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Look at what Jesus does with the metaphor. He's going to shape it into a principle for all of us that uses three pairs of contrasting terms. There's a contrast between love and hate. There's a contrast between losing and keeping. And there's a contrast between this world and eternal life. The seed, or the grain of wheat, is like our lives. 
and the person who loves his life and says, there's no way I'm going to throw my life away to let somebody else do with it what I want to do, is really going to lose his life because he needs to be dying to his own ambitions. But the person who, in inverted commas, hates his life in this world, that is, considers it as something to invest for God and not to hold on to it for himself. So that it looks like real hate by way of contrast. That person is like a farmer who plants the seed and takes the risks and sees that that single life in a seed multiply into something unbelievably wonderful. He will keep it all the way into eternity, Jesus says. So that the promise of God is that the man or the woman who gives over mastery of his life to Christ is no loser, even though the world may think him to be insane. Now, I don't know what goes on in your mind in the end of March in 2024. Maybe you're wrestling with an issue or a decision for some future, or struggling with a, an, an issue in your life, and you naturally fear getting your grip off of some issue. What might God expect of me, you say to yourself? Don't fear planting the seed of your life into the ground and letting whatever that is just die. Know that God certainly does expect this of every one of his children. This is a universal truth. There are no exceptions. Verse 25 does not say, most people who love their lives shall lose their lives, with a couple of exceptions. Most people who hate their lives in this world will keep it into life eternal, but there are a few exceptions. No, no, this is a universal principle. This is a dogmatic statement. It is universally true. Do you want to invest your life in something that's going to last forever? That's a good question for us. It doesn't matter how old we are. Some of us are younger, some of us are antiquities, and some of us are almost ready to be put into a museum. It doesn't matter how old you are, this principle always holds true. And the more we get older, um, my impression is that people think more about, um, is anybody going to remember me when I pass off the scene? We don't want to be forgotten. We want to be remembered for some achievement, for some impact, for having made a contribution, and we can pursue that goal through education or accumulation of wealth, through having influence in the community, through playing politics, to elbow our ways to the top. But Jesus says that the way to come to the end of life with something that will be remembered and that will count forever is to throw your life away by planting it like seed in the dirt. Now that's counterintuitive. So how do we do this? Well, Jesus doesn't leave us in the dark about it because he says in verse 26 how we do this. Here's the application to the disciples. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Throwing your life away, so to speak, is serving the Lord Jesus and following him. So what Jesus does and where he goes, we do likewise. And Jesus promises that his servants will one day be honored by his Father if they do this. Very clear. How do we serve Jesus, the Lord? It's easy for us to frame this in kind of uh, stained glass window terms that uh, make us all feel very comfortable at the end of a su Sunday afternoon. We go home saying, well, it wasn't that nice. 
But the day may very soon come when going with Jesus all the way to the end and serving him so that it really costs us uh, is really right on the horizon. There's a marked shift in our Western societies toward redefining just about everything that one could possibly redefine. And everything's being turned on its head. And I don't know if you catch the whiff of persecution in the air against the Christian church, not just in far off lands, but also here in this part of the world. Maybe our faith doesn't cost us much in terms of inconvenience or trouble. But what if it did? Would I be prepared to hate my own life, so to speak, to use Jesus' uh, language, in this world in comparison to the compulsion to clutch out a reputation or economic security? What would we be ready to endure for the sake of loyalty to Christ? Would we be willing to endure a hefty fine or the theft of our property? These things are being discussed by the elite in Western democracies today. Would we be willing to be fired? We were speaking with a young lady in Luxembourg last week who was talking about some of her concerns as a, uh, a teacher uh, among small children in a private school. And there's a lot of talk about the um, LGPD, no, that's Los Angeles Police Force, uh, the LGP, thank you, and transgender agenda, and associated issues. And she takes exception to the position of the school on this. The church in Luxembourg uses that school's auditorium for public meetings on Sunday mornings. This has been the case since 1987 when the Christian Community Church still was able to uh, procure the use of that school. When you come in the door, you see a large gay pride flag hanging on the wall, and uh, those who are new to the church may be a little bit shocked to see uh, that <coughs> hanging there. And so this young lady said, "I, I you know, I'm." kind of wondering what position should I take. They, my colleagues all know that I don't agree with this, but everybody else says, you know, you need to um, defend the, the agenda that wishes to totally overthrow the traditional and biological definitions of gender. She could be fired. Are we willing to deal with public disgrace through false accusation? Are we willing to lose our friends? These kinds of things and similar ones could await us in the next 10 years in Europe. Service for Christ implies that we obey him diligently because he has loved us to the point of giving his very life for us. And how could we do any less than yield to him? Absolutely. That's the question that Jesus is asking us. Loving him more than our own lives is our reasonable service, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And so verse 26 gives us a, an amazing promise, doesn't it? If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. Furthermore, if any man serve me, him will my father honor. Well, that's taking that on authority. How do we know that that's true? How do we know that this is not just some empty promise? Well, the rest of the Gospel of John and the other three synoptic Gospels affirm to us that Jesus rose from the dead after he gave his own life for us. And it is the resurrection that certifies that all of this is reality. Jesus died and he rose the third day. He was seen by many at different times and in different places. And if that is true, then this promise will be kept. 
Notice how Jesus applies this very principle to himself first in verses 27 and 28. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Jesus knows what's coming at him. He's going to have to plant the seed of his own life into the dirt, so to speak, and die so that there can be multiplication. And this is troubling to him because as God the Son, he naturally pulls back from being considered sin and being judged by the Father as if he were guilty when in fact he is, he is innocent. But what is he going to do? Uh, Father, get me out of this mess. No. For this cause I came into this hour. This is what I've come for. I'm not going to ask the Father to get me out of the problem. And so the alternative is in verse 28 in the beginning part. Father, glorify thy name. My life is not mine. It is ultimately yours, and I will follow your instructions. That, that is the example that Jesus gives. This is how he applies this principle to himself. When trouble knocks, we naturally seek immediate escape, but Jesus does not do that. Instead, he says, Lord, glorify your name. Jesus' purpose was always to honor the Father and the Father's will. And so, even in the face of death, he says, I'm not going to ask for deliverance from this, but I'm going to bring honor to my Father. And so this is the example that we are called to follow. This is the mission of every one of us, every one of the Lord Jesus' disciples. The passage is rounded out as Jesus applies the glory of his coming death in verses 29 to 35. Note in the end of verse 28, the Father's reassurance about this coming death. A voice comes from heaven, verse 28 says, and the voice says, I have both glorified and will glorify again, literally speaking. The translators have added the pronoun it, it's in italics in your translation to show that it is implied. Glorify your name, Father, and the, the voice from heaven says, I have glorified my name and will glorify it again. And the people who are around hear the sound from heaven and there's a bit of a debate about what this means. Some people say, but there's been thunder. That's kind of funny that we're hearing thunder in, I guess, the middle of the day. Others said it's an angel who spoke to Jesus. But Jesus explains in uh, verses 30 and 31 that his death will soundly defeat uh, Satan for one thing, and that this is the, one of the purposes of this statement. Verse 30, Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Jesus' death is going to soundly defeat the enemy, defeat Satan. Have you ever wondered how Satan's mission in the world, his desire to completely oppose God and vanquish God, how that is going to be defeated? Do you sometimes get frustrated because things are moving in the wrong direction? Maybe not just in your life, but in society as a whole. You see the corruption and the violence. What is required? Ultimately, Jesus says, I'm going to plant my life like a seed in the ground and I'm going to die. And that death is going to defeat the purpose of this satanic enemy. Isn't that strange? Because our natural tendency is to believe that the only way you can defeat evil is to do the Peter trick. Remember the Peter trick? You grab your sword, and then you aim for the guy's head, and when he ducks, you slice off his ear. Not too adroit. 
Peter was a fisherman, he was not a soldier, so I guess he didn't quite know how to use his sword. But this is our natural tendency to want to just push back violently and, and defeat evil by force of arms. But Jesus says that the voice that the crowd heard was for their benefit, and if the Father assured uh, Jesus this was for the sinner's ultimate benefit, because it strengthened Jesus' resolve to complete his daunting mission. He must die, but his sacrifice of substitutionary judgment and punishment was going to ultimately defeat the, the satanic enemy of God, the ruler of this world system. And it's totally counterintuitive that the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, who becomes sin for, for us, for sinning people, would be able to ensure the ejection of the devil from this world. And one day that is actually going to happen. He's going to be placed in some place that the Apostle John in Revelation chapter 20 called the abyss. And he will be in the end finally defeated by being thrown into the lake of fire. Jesus' death is going to soundly, de soundly defeat satanic opposition. That's important for us to remember because when we die, following the Lord Jesus' example, we also are in a position to oppose satanic work in our own life and in the life of our loved ones and our community in totally unexpected ways. It's doing what doesn't make sense, humanly speaking, by human reason, that we defeat the enemy of our souls. We say no to ourselves. We're willing to die to our own uh, great ambitions or to our own way of doing things, that is how we defeat the enemy. And furthermore, in verses 32 to 33, Jesus is setting the example of dying and then rising again will open a door to all kinds of people. Do you see that in verses 32 and 33? I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And this he said, signifying what death he should die. By being lifted up in death, Jesus would be able to draw all men to himself. This is not a promise of universal salvation without exception. It is the promise of an offer to all men without distinction between ethnic groups. He's going to draw Jews and non-Jews to himself. One seed falls into the ground, Many are harvested in the end. And that is true for you. You want, God, you want God to do something significant through your life? So that when they put you in a pine box, or maybe it'll be oak, the things that are said of you will be true, at least if they're good things. Most eulogies are completely over the top. I don't know how many funeral services you've been to, but we tend to romanticize those who have passed on. But it is a great thing to go to a funeral service where the things that are said of godly people are actually true. And when people who come to a funeral service have been actually impacted through the life of that believer who has departed, it is true of Jesus that his death and then resurrection opens the door not to just to Jews and to Gentiles, uh, but it is also true of us that uh, our death to ourselves will open a door to all kinds of people. And if you hold on to your life, then that result is not going to come. The crowd is confused, verses 34 to 36. The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever, and how sayest thou the Son of Man must be lifted up? What are you talking about, the Son of Man? Jesus saith unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. Well, that's true, isn't it? You ever walked around in a dark room where you don't know where the furniture is? We had a little bit of that experience this week in Luxembourg. Our host and hostess had these 
you know, blinds that they drop down, and the metal ones, they, they get so, so um, tongue and grooved that uh, when you close them, uh, it's pitch black. And when we got up in the morning or got up in the course of the night to uh, use the facilities, we have to kind of edge around the bed and wondering, that, let's see now, that's the bureau, that's the mirror, over here, the, the bed should be over, and then over here is the door. It's not a pleasant experience to walk around in the dark. And there are billions of people today who are walking around in the dark, and they don't know where they're going. And yet there is a light, Jesus says, and he is that light. While you have it, believe in the light that you might be children of light. So this is the final question that the passage ends with, and it transitions to something else from verses 37 uh, later on. Uh, Jesus replies to the crowd's confusion. They wonder about all of this talk about the Son of Man and his coming death, and he's being lifted up, and being a seed, and pining the seed in the dirt and dying. What is all of this about? Jesus does not really answer them directly, does he? Instead, he goes back to the theme of his impending death, and he is the light of the world. He will not be with them more than a little longer, and while he is there, they must walk in the light so that the darkness doesn't overtake them and prevent them from seeing where they're going. If they will trust his word, believing the light, they will become sons of light, and there will be an impact on other people. Put the seed in the ground, let it die, and there will be a multiplied reproduction of the light that is in you. Respond to the light and you will become sons of light. There's that same multiplying dynamic, but a different metaphor. My friends, this is true. And you and I can live our lives for ourselves. And this can go on decade after decade after boring decade. And you can get to the point in your life where you say, what on earth am I doing here? Uh, I, I, there's got to be something more, and there is, because the purpose of life is to die to yourself and to learn to know who is the light of life and give yourself over to him, and you just watch what he does, what, what he does with your life, and you won't even see all of the, the fruit of that maybe in this life, but there will be evidence of it in the life to come. So Madame J listened to these many Bible studies over many weeks and finally stopped at the end of chapter 12. And she said, je vais pas faire ça. I am not going to hate my own life. I'm not an idiot. And that was the last Bible study. Never saw her again. I lost track of her for many years, and then Kathy and I heard news about her. She had moved to a flat up the road on a street called the Route de Longy, and she was a concierge, kind of a lady. You know what a concierge is? She takes care of keeping the floors mopped and listening to the gossip of the neighbors and kind of keeping track of what's going on in the large apartment house. And uh, this particular building was at the corner of the Route de Longy, which went between Luxembourg City and a Belgian city way down across the border. And another street, which was called the Avenue Grand Duchesse Charlotte. Grand Duchesse Charlotte was the Grand Duchess who represented the Grand Duchy in Britain during the, the Second World War. And this road, the Grand Duchesse Charlotte Boulevard, would come along, and there was a stoplight here and a stoplight there, and uh, people who zoomed around that boulevard had to slow down for the traffic light. It was a fine spring Sunday morning, and Madame J was uh, tidying up the sidewalk and putting it all into a dustpan on the corner when a huge lorry 
with the container behind it, careened around the corner of the Boulevard Grand Duchesse Charlotte and came down close to the traffic light, but because it was going far too fast and the driver lost control, it smashed into the corner of the apartment block, striking Madame G and killing her instantly. And when I heard about that, I thought, wow. Here is a lady who heard the gospel and said, no way, Jose, I am not going to give up my life for any Jesus, even if he's an exceptional person. I'm not going to live for him. I'm going to live for me. And Madame J could have been any of us in uh, our Spanish neighborhood, in our tourist town. And unless the Lord Jesus returns before we pass through death's doorway, all of us are going to have to face the reality that this life does not last forever. The choice that Jesus placed before his disciples and his listeners is a stark choice. Love your life and you will lose it. Hate your life, you'll get it back. It's a universal call just as his provision for the salvation of the entire world is universal. But it requires a response of love. If Jesus died for you, then his call to you to serve him without reservation is just as universal. My friends, let's not be fearful, especially in this Passion Week 2024, as we think particularly about the death of Christ, his resurrection from the dead. Let's not fear to love and serve the Lord Jesus as he urges us to do. There was glory ahead for him. There is glory ahead for us as well, if we're willing to be planted as a seed and to die to our ambitions. I hope you believe this. Will you act upon it this week? Die to ourselves knowing that our life will be multiplied by his power. That is what it takes to serve the Savior of the world. Thank you, Father, that you have given us this wonderful passage of Scripture in John's Gospel. We want to serve you this week. Teach us what it means as we go through each day to die to ourselves and to live for you with the confidence that the Father is going to use us for his glory. Thank you that we can, in some small measure, imitate the example of our Savior in this way. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.